Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity to be gathered here in this place with this people around this word. We thank you for every opportunity we have to spend time in your holy word, O God, and we pray that as we do so today that the words of my mouth, the thoughts and prayers of all of our hearts would be pleasing to you that they would bear much fruit in our lives when we leave this place, not only in the lives of those who hear them and receive them, but those whose lives we touch this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we move toward Easter, we are spending time during Lent on the final days of Jesus' earthly life. When last we met, we were in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus had held the Last Supper with his disciples. After doing this, they all moved from there to the Mount of Olives. While on the Mount of Olives, Jesus prayed. And during that prayer, he was arrested by the temple guards who had been tipped off by one of the twelve disciples, Judas Iscariot. After being arrested, Jesus was taken to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. And it is at the house of Caiaphas, in the middle of the night, the night before Jesus is to die on the cross, that we encounter the next two events in his life. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 26, verse 57 to 75. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. Peter was following at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat down with the guards to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward who said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest, Caiaphas, stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. And then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? And they answered, he deserves to die. And they spat in his face, and they struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy now to us, Messiah. Who is it that hits you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came and said to him, You, you were also with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them and said, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, this man was also with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know that man. And after a while, the bystanders came up to Peter and said, surely you are also one of them, for your accent gives you away. But Peter began to curse, and he swore an oath and said, I do not know that man. And at that moment, the cock crowed. 
And Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. The word of God for the people of God. Caiaphas was powerful. He was the high priest. He was elected to a one-year term that could be renewed. He served over a council, the highest legal and religious council called the Sanhedrin that was made up of 70 priests and elders and scribes. We know that Caiaphas was powerful because it would not be uncommon for a high priest to be reelected several times so that maybe for five to seven years the high priest might be in power. Caiaphas was in power for 18 years. 18 years. And when he meets Jesus, he's at the end of those 18 years. He is the ultimate incumbent. He has authority. He has influence. He has power. We know that he has power because he has the Sanhedrin, the council, the whole council, the Bible tells us, ready to meet. They're on standby. At the drop of a hat, when he calls them to meet, when they arrest Jesus, they're there. Even if it's in the middle of the night, he's got them there at his house. And we know that they're there at the house that quickly because we know that Caiaphas is known for some time that Jesus was going to die. It was just a matter of when. Do you remember Lazarus? Lazarus. John chapter 11. Jesus' dear friend lived in Bethany just outside Jerusalem. He died, had been in the tomb for four days. Jesus got to the house. Martha ran out to meet him. And said, if only you'd been here earlier, my brother would not have died. He got a little closer to the house. Mary said, if only you'd been here earlier, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, it's okay, take me to the tomb. Remember that? And he raised Lazarus to live again. Well, on that day, the priests, all these priests, they gathered together and they're worried. They said to one another, and they said to Caiaphas, this Jesus is drawing a lot of attention to himself and by extension to us. And so far, the Romans who rule over this area, they've left us pretty much alone and we can do what we want. But if Jesus keeps doing this kind of stuff, the Romans might come in. They might exert more of their will and influence and that would mean our power being compromised. We can't have that. This is all right there in John chapter 11. We can't have that. And so Caiaphas stands up in front of all of them and says, Jesus must die. And here's how he does it. He hides behind some real powerful words, scary, dangerous words, logical, rational words. He says, essentially, for the sake of all of us, this man must die. In order to protect our power, this man has to be eliminated. Now, that's utilitarian philosophy. It's been around over 100 years now. The greatest good for the greatest number. That's how we make ethical decisions. Not everybody's going to be uh, kept from harm, but as long as the greatest majority of us are okay, what does it matter that a few over here are, are hurts. That's essentially utilitarian philosophy. That's what Caiaphas is saying here. It's better that this one guy suffers a lot as opposed to all of us losing a little bit of what we enjoy right now. It all sounds so neat, clean, and tidy, doesn't it? It sounds logical, practical, maybe even necessary to protect these over here. This one has to go. There's no other way to look at it. Those are dangerous words because they, they overlook the fact that that one 
that's not part of this group over here, he's going to suffer a horribly violent, excruciatingly painful death. And yet we do that sometimes, even today. We, we shield ourselves from the reality of violence by using clean, neat, tidy words that underneath the service are pretty dangerous. Think about it. When we use phrases like ethnic cleansing, collateral damage, casualties of war, we put death and violence and harm and, and suffering far, far away. Because nobody's really getting hurt. They're being cleansed. Nobody's really suffering. They're casualty. The most dangerous words we can say sometimes are those that depersonalize, take the person out of the situation. And once we do that, it's an easy step to dehumanizing them. And once we dehumanize them, then their life or their death becomes just one more logical decision based on cost-benefit analysis that we make. That's what Caiaphas did. To protect his own power, he hid behind logical, rational words. And yet those weren't the only words that were spoken that night. Jesus stands here in front of the the whole council of priests. And they're looking for some motive that they can use to legitimize what they're going to do, which is kill Jesus. And so there are many accusatory words spoken about him, to him, at him. I heard him say this. I heard him say this. My cousin's nephew's brother said that he was going to do this. And then finally two come forward and they bring up a charge that's as good as any. We heard this man say he was going to destroy the temple. And if that was the case, it's high treason. High treason for two reasons. The temple in Jerusalem was the literal dwelling place of God. God literally lived inside the temple. And so to desecrate the space was to desecrate the living room of God. And that was blasphemy. The greatest expression of profaneness or profanity that one could do. But more than that, or just as importantly, the temple employed thousands and thousands of people A whole region was based economically on the temple running the way it had always been run. And so to destroy the temple was to destroy the life as it had been known. Now, never mind the fact that the Bible says that these witnesses were false, that the testimony was false. Twice Matthew tells us this. But you see, that's the way it is, isn't it? When we want to protect what's dear to us, Those priests, they they were willing to say whatever. It didn't matter if it might have been false, if it was true or not. Anything. If we can pin anything on him, true or not, we're going to do it to protect what we're afraid of losing. Dangerous words. And we do that again and again. In little ways and big ways. In fact, we could say the whole story of human history is that way. Whenever one group is afraid of another group, Whenever one person is afraid of another person, afraid that that group out there is going to come and take what I love and what I know to be sacred and consider to be ultra important, I am willing to say anything, the ugliest words, the meanest words. It doesn't matter if they're true or not. If I can levy any charge against them, I'm going to do that out of fear of losing what is sacred to me. It's been said that that people don't like change. It's not true. People change, and we're accepting of change all the time. We don't want to lose in change. That's what the false witnesses did. They were afraid of losing, and so they're willing to say anything, anything against Jesus. And even those, though, weren't the only words spoken that day, that night. While all of this is going on inside the house, Peter is outside. He's outside in the courtyard. And we think that Peter's the number one disciple, the right-hand man of Jesus, the most favored one. But we'd be forgiven for not thinking that just by looking and listening to him today. Because you see, while Jesus is inside under the bright lights of interrogation and endures 
hours of questioning from intellectual experts, Peter is outside, isn't he? He's cowering in the shadows. He's over in the darkness. And when, when he's confronted by one question from a servant, he buckles. He buckles, caves under the pressure. And when he does open his mouth to speak, he speaks, he speaks denying words that are words worse than lying. He curses Jesus, and he swears an oath against Jesus, and he essentially says that Jesus doesn't exist. Truly, I tell you, I do not even know that man. As far as I'm concerned, he doesn't even exist. Peter's afraid. He's afraid. And sometimes when we're afraid to protect our own comfort and safety, we'll say anything. Say anything. That's what Peter did to Jesus. I love the story right here in the passion story of Jesus. This is one of my favorite episodes. And I don't know why exactly. I'm always drawn to the house of Caiaphas when we tell the passion story of Christ. And when we went to Jerusalem, when we went to the Holy Land in 2008, I loved going to the house of Caiaphas and to see the tombs underground where prisoners were housed awaiting trial before the Sanhedrin. And when I think about the events, when we read it today, just preparing for this week and thinking about these events, all I could think of was all these words that were swirling around, all of these words swirling around Jesus. So many words spoken that night by ruthless Caiaphas and relentless priests. Words spoken by false witnesses and deceitful disciples. Convincing words, but condemning words. Persuading words, but accusing words. Denying and lying and chastising words. Hurtful, fearful, hateful words. Conniving words, contriving words. Words repulsive, impulsive, scheming, demeaning. Conniving, contriving, conflicting, inflicting, and convicting. Words of shame and blame, disdain and cause pain. Words undeserving, so self-serving. Words hating, debating, articulating, gesticulating, pontificating, manipulating, sensationalizing, trivializing, ultimately demoralizing. Words spoken with skill and yet words that ultimately kill. So many words spoken around Jesus by those trying to protect what they had known, life as they knew it. And the, the sad irony about this whole thing is that in the midst of all of these words, the word, the word, the word could not be heard. You see, in other words, the healing word, the saving word, the helping word, the hopeful word, the inspiring word, the truly life-giving word, the redeeming word, the word that reveals life as it really can be and ought to be and will be, the word that shines like a light in the darkness in which the darkness cannot overcome, the word made flesh to dwell among us, that word could not be heard because of all the other words that were spoken around it. The great tragedy of Caiaphas's house is that Jesus was right there, speaking and standing, could not be seen, could not be heard, because of all of the words that were spoken in self-preservation around him. And I think it's true for us today. There's so many words spoken around us, through us, in us, among us, with us, by us, for us, by others, to us. And it can be easy to lose the life-saving word that is speaking at the same time. Every time we open the Bible, every time we open the Bible, turn to any page, what do we find? Words, hundreds and hundreds of words on every page. And every book of the Bible is comprised of thousands of words, and we call them little W words, little W words, lowercase w words. And those lowercase w words, there's thousands of them, they teach us a lot about the context in which Jesus lived. The, the audience that might have heard these words for the first time, 
They teach us knowledge, information about God, about God's people, about God's will. But in the midst of all of these little W words, there is a capital W word, a large W word, a truth that God seeks to speak to your heart and to mine, a message of hope and inspiration and clarity about faith, about Christ, about salvation, about deliverance, about promise and provision and redemption. And we don't want to lose that big W word in the midst of all these little words that are spoken and written and read. And for me, when I read these words today, the capital W word that comes out in high relief, this truth that stands at the center in the midst of all these other words is this. Jesus Christ is true power and true life. That's it. Jesus is true power and true life. And that's what he was trying to say. He said, ah, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. I am the one seated at the right hand. Now, as pastor, as Michael, I don't know, I don't know what that means in your individual life as the details of your life unfolds. And if I did, I would tell you with all the clarity and assurance that I had. But I do know that he is true life and true power. He is true life and true, true power. Always, forever. Now the people in Caiaphas' house missed it. That's the tragedy. They missed it because they were so focused on the life that they knew that they missed the life that was standing right in front of them. Life that they were being called to. And so they stand as a, a reminder to us not to lose that. Not to make that same mistake. And the season of Lent is our internal reminder in the church here that reminds us of that. So that's my prayer for us that we retain that big W word in the midst of all these other little ones. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you that you stand in the middle of all of our words and speak a message of truth and hope and inspiration to us. And may that guide us as the details of our lives are worked out. In your name we pray. Amen.